That's all. This is adult Sunday school. No, that's it. No, it's not. No, it's fine. No, 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 First, we thank you. We want to bless you, Lord. Just bless you. We you blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And we sure didn't deserve it. We still don't. But you're a giver. And you, thank you for loving us unconditionally. Thank you for your word that we can know your heart, your mind, your will. That it can work in us and energize us spiritually. Guide us. And I pray your Holy Spirit will be the real teacher here this morning. And I pray also for the pastor as he ministers in the church service that your Holy Spirit would empower him and that he would illumine every mind to grasp the truth from your word so we can apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. And I'm not going to deal a lot on verse 3 because I sort of, we went through it. I was going to do that series on our spiritual blessings, but I just gave you a little taste. Uh, some of them, and I hope uh, that whether you have type that you would research it on your own. And if anyone needs uh, a study on that, um, I got a thing out there on the Grace and Truth Ministry book table, mm -hmm. and also if you want a copy, I have about 45 spiritual blessings. Um, Brock, whose book is out there, uh, Commentary on Ephesians, um, he's got about 100 spiritual blessings. We're so rich, all by God's grace, right? So let's start in Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, and we'll, we'll just read it first. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, that's past tense, when did that happen? The moment you trusted in Christ. Blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according to as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> that remind you of anything? That's part of the mystery. That right? was unsearchable in time past. Unsearchable since the world began, right? Um, <clears throat> that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. So the first thing we should notice is, Paul begins by what? Praising God, right? And he's utilizing him. Uh, what's a eulogy? When someone yeah. usually you do you eulogy at a wake, right? Um, and you're—I have never heard anybody do a bad eulogy, you know, unless you let that one person in family get up there and you know, shit up. But uh, it's usually saying what? How wonderful the good qualities of that person. When Paul is utilizing God, that's living, our living God. We don't serve a dead God, a man-made God. We serve a living God, don't we? Um, so, and what's he doing? He's blessing him for blessing us, right? See, that's what happens. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. You know, uh, God's the, the initiator. We're the responder. And so, he's being specific and he's calling our God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? He doesn't say Allah or any man-made religion God, such as many gods in Hinduism and also Mormonism. Uh, let's go to Genesis 1.1. Keep your finger there because we're going to come back. I 
got a little piece of paper there. Genesis 1-1. 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 Genesis 1-1.
not everybody who says Jesus is Lord is there's a, doesn't Paul warn us about those who preach another Jesus another spirit and they teach that what God is uh, man can become what man is God once was see they teach you can become a God where does that remind you Genesis, sisters, studies Bible, Genesis 3. You can be this good. You can be little guys. <clears throat> the word faith, uh, the real, uh, a lot of them, I won't say all of them, but they teach we're little guys. Because if God's our father, then we're little guys, because dogs have puppy dogs, right? Elephant, and so they say, if God can speak things into existence, so can we. Boy, that's bad logic. You know, we're not guys. We're God's children. We got this DNA, spiritual DNA. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not the Holy Spirit. See, uh, it's very, you got to know the essentials of the Christian faith, like the Trinity, or the triunity of God. I'm teaching that in uh uh, India now to the group of pastors that I had that Bible study in the morning on uh, Wednesdays. Um, because, you know, it's a, well, there's a lot of bad teaching in our country, right, even in America. But when you get out into some of these other countries, man, you know, okay, oh, yeah, you know, stuff, you just say, how could they, how could they believe that? You know? um, because, you know what? We got the word of God, so we know truth. What Jesus said, sanctify them by, by that word. That word is true. And Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? So we see God is an omnipotent God, right? I mean, it, it's nothing for him to speak for um, things that uh, didn't exist before, and, and they, ha they happen, right? Um, see, knowing these things should teach us something. What are you facing in your life? What struggles you got in your life? I want you to think about it. Uh, and it's probably dangerous to ask that because some people like to, uh, you know, uh, complain and, oh, I got this arthritis. Oh, yeah, and then you didn't see my scar when I got my appendix taken out. And I'm going bold and, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but what are you facing? Maybe you ain't even tell, telling anybody. We're all facing things. Uh, yeah. When you know that, and you know who he is, and you keep that in your mind, you got to take every thought captive. Right? God is all powerful. Nothing's too big for him. Right? He's all knowing. Right? He's omniscient. He's all knowing. He knows even when you don't bring things to him. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're struggling with. So why not just bring it to him? Talk to Abba. Abba, okay. Talk it over with him. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 45, verse 5 and 6. It's a little bit after. Isaiah... Tell Mary I'm repeating these verses three times. That's what she's always telling me. Um, Isaiah 45, verse 45 and 6. Isaiah 45, verse 5 and 6. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God besides me. I girded thee. Though thou hast not known me, he's dealing with the uh, nation Israel, that they may know from the raising of the sun and from and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There's only one God. But that one God is what? Revealed in three persons. Jesus is not. The Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit ain't the Son. But they're all three persons and one God. Now, we might not be able to uh, totally comprehend that. And, you know, if I could, I wouldn't be as impressed with that. 
if I could understand everything, you know, then I would be like, I would be like that, right? But we can apprehend it. You know, you think of a egg, right? What's the egg? The shell, the yolk, or the white? It's all the egg, right? But there's three parts of it. What, what about, we're created in God's image, right? Man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. What's man? All of it, right? All of that. So, when we know this word, when we study this word, because this is God's word, right? You know, the Bible is the only book that the author has ever really studied. Think about that. God's in you, Paul talks about. The Holy Spirit's in you, and Christ is in you. You can do all things through Christ. You're never alone, you know. I have to always remind myself of that. When I'm in pain, you know, in which I am now, you can keep me in prayer, still from my surgery, but you know what I do? Because I gotta do, I won't get into details, I'm not gonna be like that old person I was just talking about. But it's painful, so I gotta do. And you know what I do? Appropriate by faith what I've learned from this work. As I'm having to do it and it's painful, I'm going, thank you, Father, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't take away the pain, but I, I go through it and I don't get depressed. And we can all do that. We need not just to know this word, right? That's so important to know it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it. And But I always say don't stop there. you got to apply it, right? So let's go to uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3, 5. First Timothy 2, 3, verses 3 through 5. First, he's talking about praying for those in authority. I hope we're doing that. <clears throat> our, our country sure could use a lot of prayers. Um, but myself, I don't keep my focus on what's going on. You know, not only in our country or in the world or whatever. I try and keep my focus on Christ and redeeming the time. Because what's important? Things come and go, right? They change. We live in a world. You know, the only thing that won't change is God's unconditional love for you. He's working all things for your good. And our meaning and purpose is what? For Christ in us to express itself out of us. And so what's God's will? What's the most important thing? Let's, well, um, it's very important. I think it, it should, this should help us keep our focus. Um, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. So what's God's desire? All men to be saved, right? Wait a minute, a Calvinist told me God chooses only, only some to be saved. And others can't then. So God's being a monster saying, you can't get saved, but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll be saved. All God's word exposes man-made tradition, doesn't it? And human philosophy. Actually, we're going to see in, um, when we go back to the book Ephesians, um, that Ephesians chapter 1 destroys man-made tradition <clears throat> and the teachings of Calvinism and the charismatic and Pentecostal doctrines that they teach, that you get Jesus and then tarry for the Holy Spirit, you get the Holy Spirit later. That destroys it. You know, if people would just go to this word, right? Get your understanding, your doctrine. But what's the key for God's word to be most profitable? All scripture is profitable. Rightly dividing the word of truth, right? Study to show thyself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed by the divine word of truth. What's that tell you? Study takes work, right? That's why you're working. Sometimes we don't like working, right? <clears throat> Whether it's physical work, I don't feel like getting up going to work, right? Um, but what do you do? You do it, don't you? If, you? if you work. 
same thing with God's Word. I know i got to get into this Word, because if I don't, and I have to be careful for myself, and I know um, the pastor and pastors and Bible teachers, because sometimes we're so busy ministering other people and preparing, like I said, I think there are one, two, three, four, six different things for, for the week in the different ministries I do. I have to watch. I get that I don't slack up in my own personal Bible study and my time with the Lord, you know, um, and not just stop there, but during the day, staying focused and pray, praying without ceasing, right? That means staying in a prayerful mindset, just <clears throat> remembering the privilege it is to have this relationship and we can have intimacy with God, right? And how we're going to do that is knowing His Word, because how's the Holy Spirit speak to us through His Word rightly divided, right? Um, so, 1 Timothy 2, 3, 5. Starting in verse 4 again. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God's will is that all men be saved. So what should be our goal of redeeming the time? Reaching out to the lost, right? It's God's will. <clears throat> Ask God. I always pray, God, fill my, my heart with your love for the lost. You know, don't let me be selfish and not care about what they think. Oh, they're not going to think I'm cool. They're going to think I'm a Jesus for it. So what? I used to be the black sheep of my family. You want to be like Polly? They talked about me then. So why not? Let them talk about you for something good. And you know, you know that Penn and Stoller, the comedians? The one guy's an atheist, but he says, you know, I have Christians uh, telling me God's applause me and stuff. He says, but only one gave me a Bible. He says, I respect that person. <clears throat> He's reach, really reaching out. So he did something to show him the love. Not just, you know, like a clinging symbol. You know, if we have not love, just like a clean some. If we know all the mysteries, right? But have my love. So anyway, he desires all men to be saved, and then what? After we reach reach them, and we should be outreaching in our personal life and as a church together. I keep I was talking to Jacob about this, because he even mentioned, you know, in these grace churches, you're seeing a lot of right here. You know, in Tennessee, I was able to preach at that little church, and there was a lot of older people. But <clears throat> some were on vacation, and uh, uh, there was some uh, out. But I, I told I'm telling Jacob, you young people gotta step up. I'm proud of uh, you, brother. He's stepping up, you know, which was a hard thing for him. <laughs> you know, he said, I got so much respect for the Word of God that I don't want to make a mistake. I go, well, if we all thought like that, nobody will be preaching, because I make mistakes. I say the wrong verse, or I might say a, a word wrong in the verse, you know. But if we're available, God will use us. And it takes a step of faith. And uh, the Holy Spirit will take that resurrection power in our lives and, and give us boldness. He'll fill our hearts with love. And so then once, once we lead them to the Lord, you know, say you let a person in your personal life at work or uh, at the golf club, get your, your girls getting your hair done, let your hairdresser or the lady in the dryer next to you. Now invite them to come to church. So what? They can come to the knowledge of the truth. They can get built up in sound grace doctrine. Because sometimes, you know, at Billy Graham uh, crusades, they used to always do that off the call, right? But then they would, people, some people got saved. My pastor, uh, where me and Boyd used to go, Jim Kirkwood, he got saved at a Billy Graham's uh, crusade. Oh, you took? She got saved. <laughs> <laughs> See, husbands don't listen. They don't listen to Lord. <laughs> I got you today. I haven't even mentioned anything about uh, coming up short. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's too early and 
Tell him beat me up, Bob. What are you doing? Uh, I love you, Bob. He's my son. Um, anyway, but then sometimes people get saved. Like me, I got saved watching uh, Christian TV. I wasn't in no church. It's just I knew I had that. Nobody had to tell me. The only thing is I chose a bad way to find a church. <laughs> They'll pick you up. That ain't the best way to choose a church. I always say when people ask me, you know, we drive about an hour. Why do we come all the way out here? And I go, because the teaching is sound. My pastor teaches verse by verse. And he's a very caring and loving pastor. He's genuine. And there's love amongst the brethren. And I said, to me, that's a Bellman's church. I have to go to the corner, save gas, and mileage on my car. But I'm going to take my, well, even if I wasn't married, didn't have steps on, I would uh, myself drive myself out of here. You know? um, because I want to be on the sound teaching. And then I want to not only come to church to get it, then I want to get it. That's why I'm up here. You know, um, So that's why we all do our little um, things. Sue does. The back of the Grace and the Truth thing, uh, her nice designs, and you got Myrtle there. You know, you're, um, these are starting to deal with Sunday school with the kids, and you with the adult Sunday school. Um, and so that's when everybody does. Uh, just jump back before we go here while I'm there. In Ephesians, I think it's. Four. Yeah, um, 4.16, Ephesians 4.16, Ephesians 4.16. From, who, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by which every joint supplies according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. See, all the members, every part, make it the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. See, that's when we come and we take in that sound doctrine. Now, that doctrine should work in us and work in our wills, right? The Word of God that worketh in you and spiritually energize us. And then, then we build each other up. I get encouraged when I come to church. There's a song about it, you know? Some people think that, you know, you don't need to come to church. I'm like, I don't know where you find that. So, <coughs> you know, I like watching uh, Les Feldick and uh, Transformed by Grace, Kevin Sadler. He's probably my, one of my favorite Bible teachers. But that's good if there's not a Grace Church around to go to. But it's important to come, and not only for you, you've got a gift. Inward gift. I'm talking about speaking in tongues and you know, um, <clears throat> but and and you you help build up the body and that if I maybe somebody needs what God has gifted you in, you know, maybe some maybe someone is going to encourage you. Or uh, I know when me and Mary have needed help financially, how many times our church has reached out when I was in the hospital, and I'm up, I'm. Be forever grateful. He was there for memory, my family. And so um, I go back to Ephesians. <laughs> I gotta remember the time. <laughs> I remember the time. It was I don't know why I thought it was till 10:45, and all of a sudden it's got about 10:35, and I see the pastor. Started walking back and forth. I go, is he stressed about what he's going to teach? And all of a sudden he's going, <coughs> I go, what? I got 10 minutes. And he's like, <laughs> if he would have had one of them staffs, remember the gong, gong show? He would have been here. So I, ever since then, unless I want to get in, uh, wake him up before he preaches. Um, I have 2 Timothy 2. Let me go through that whole thing. 2 Timothy 2. I don't know if I read it. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, second, not second Timothy 2, 35. Second Timothy. Now we're going to be in second Timothy 2, 35. And the things which thou hast heard of me, this is Paul, and he's uh, instructing Timothy, but in a secondary way, it's instructing us too. Um, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we need to learn the grace message, right? How do I lead the Bible? Word? Understand the mystery, then you teach other faithful men. Um, and the problem is, nowadays, sometimes men behind the pulpit aren't being faithful. And I, I'd say the majority of the pulpit. The Paul's unique gospel, his, his unique apostleship, and the message he calls a mystery, that whole body of truth, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace. I always got to take a breath. When, but I got a lot of words coming out. So, and then he says, Thou therefore endured hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that war entangles himself with the affairs of his life. See, that's what I'm talking about. Don't get caught up. Satan's the great distractor. Don't get caught up with what's going on in the world. Because it's Satan behind that. And remember, God is always above him. And eventually, everything comes out of God's will. If things get real bad in our country, guess what? Remember Y2K? The churches were filled up because they thought it might be the end of the world. You know, it seems like when there's prosperity, people get apathetic. But when things start getting scary and tough, people start thinking about that. Right? Even unsafe people start praying. Yeah. But he says, no man that work, and, and you can consider this too, ladies, um, because you should be teaching um, other women too, right? Older women teach younger women, right? um, and sharing. And why, why don't we get caught up in the first of its life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier? And if a man also strive for mastery, yet is he not found to stop to strive lawfully? So how do you, how do you, um, he's talking about rewards here. What are the rules? See what he's talking about? He, he, he strived lawfully. Or, the idea here, I think, is like, you think of the Olympics? They've got to go by the rules, right? Or they're disqualified, right? <coughs> now, in that same chapter, what does he say? What are, how do we know the rules? Second Timothy um, 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed. Why? Because you're following the rules. Rightly dividing the word of truth. This way you you learn what is our commands, right? Paul says, I give you the commands of Christ, right? What are our promises? So you don't get sucked into the TV preachers promising you health, wealth, and um, whatever your little heart desire. God just going to spoil it. He wants you to have your best life now. No, it ain't the best life now. Heaven is going to be the best. Amen. That's why we look for that blessed hope, right? But while we're here, let's redeem the time. Invest it. Because we're going to be in heaven a long time. And I got this book, uh, Tim Borkin. You know what you won't be able to do in heaven? Lead nobody to the Lord. It's only why you're here. And also, it's only why you're here that you're going to have to really depend upon Christ in you and appropriate by faith, Romans chapter 6. Because we won't have sin natures after the rapture, right? But up till then, God has equipped us, right? We can do all things through Christ, strengthens us. So <coughs> notice from uh, Ephesians 1.3, um, we're going to be going in a minute to uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. But notice from Ephesians 1.3, all of our spiritual blessings from God are because we're in Christ. We don't get none outside of Christ. I was thanking God um, when I was getting ready. 
But thank you for that I'm in Christ. And I'm, you bless me with every spiritual blessing because I sure didn't deserve it, and I sure don't now. But I'm sure thankful. See, when you realize you don't deserve it, you see, people think they're real good people. They think God owes them something, right? God don't owe us none but hell. That's what we earn. The wages of sin is that. But, aren't you glad for the buck? The gift of God is what? Eternal life in Jesus Christ the Lord. So, it's all because we're in Christ. Because through Christ's finish and all sufficient work on our behalf, God's now free to bless us with every spiritual blessing according to the riches of His grace. Think about that. God shares His riches with us. He makes us a joint heir with Christ. Does that make you want to serve him? It makes me want to serve God. Because I deserve hell and it gives me hell. I was spiritually dead and it gives me resurrection um, spiritual life. See, grace is a great motivator for service, right? It's not God's going to punish you if you don't serve him. I think you'll miss out. One thing I'm rewards in heaven, but not only that, in this life, there's nothing like when God uses you. How did you like teaching one, the adult class of that? Mm, very good. Right? Mm. Well, and God uses you, and then, you know, I hope you were encouraging to him, for, and uh, I think he said he got good feedback, so I'm glad. But when God uses you, there's nothing like it. Whether it's to bring somebody to the Lord, to share the mystery, share how to really divide the word, Maybe to help somebody financially or just listen, hold them, pray with them. You know, we're, we're, Christ is ahead, we're his body, right? We're his hands, we're his mouth, um, his eyes. He uses us. So sometimes he takes our arm. Mary's great for that. She'll cry with somebody. You know, when they're in pain or they're going through something, like at a wake or a funeral, Mary starts crying with them. You know, I'll hug somebody, but I don't stop laughing. And they can feel Mary's love. You know? um, so first, Thessalonians. Uh, wait a minute. Go back first to Ephesians 1.4, and then we're going to go to first Thessalonians. Ephesians 1.4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, remember that's part of the mystery, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, how does God choose people? Is that saying, because this is what Calvinism, they love these, these verses, and the next one about God predestined some to be saved. This isn't about unsaved people getting saved. Who's Paul writing to? Saved people. Saints, right? So it's not God's choosing to save some sinners and then the tulip, you know, Calvinism, uh, total depravity, unlimited uh, atonement, or um, limited atonement. Um, anyway, I'll, I got to write it down, but um, that's their little uh, formula. And this is not about, so when you come across somebody, and we got brothers and sisters that follow Calvinism. And, and the body of Christ. Dave used to. Pastor used to. I never did because it just didn't sound right to me even as a young person. I seen Christ die for what does uh, John 3.16 say? Of course, you know, everybody knows that verse, but they don't know the context of it. For God so loved the world. It's not the earth, right? He didn't love the earth, it's the people. So, let's see how God calls people. <clears throat> you know, because in Calvinism, they would say, <laughs> Kirk would you say, some magical faith dust comes down in your heart and God calls you to believe. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17, hearing by the word of God. So we got to share the gospel with an unsaved person. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. <laughs> yeah. 
For this cause, also thank we God, without ceasing, praise God. Without ceasing, we should be thanking God for a job. Because when you receive the word which you heard from us, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? Now, we can be loving the people, right? But if we don't share the gospel with them, you know, they say, you know, uh, the way we treat people is our customer. Well, yeah, that's got to go along with the message, but if you don't share the gospel, nobody's going to say So then we've got to share the gospel. So um, you receive that not as the word of man, but as, as, as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. So when somebody believes in God, well, it works in them. Let's go now to uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. But we are bound. Here's Paul giving thanks again. Paul says full of thanks, and he's our pattern. What should we be for? Thanksgiving to God. Thanking him for the body of Christ. Thanking him for people you don't like in the body of Christ. They're still your brother and sister. Right? Aren't you thankful that brother and sister sometimes you both heads with? Right? But you're still thankful. I'm talking about your physical family. Right? You're still thankful for them. But we are bound to give thanks always for you, or always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord. That's us, beloved of the Lord. Because God has, from the beginning, chosen you to salvation. How does God choose? To sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. See, God chooses those who will believe the gospel. <coughs> Then he makes them holy and acceptable in his sight. Then he declares them righteous. And that's available to everybody, not just a select few. Wherefore he, how did God call them? Wherefore he called you by our gospel. See the gospel. To the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Spiritual things with spiritual. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Now he's talking, he's writing to believers, right? Mm -hmm. In whom ye also trusted after you what? Heard the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by, the, by God's word, right? The gospel of your salvation, listen this, and whom after you believe, you were, sealed. you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So as soon as you believe the gospel, you were sealed, you received the Holy Spirit, right? So that throws out Pentecostalism and uh, charismatic doctrine that, um, and I'm not putting down Pentecostals or charismatics, I used to be one as a baby Christian before I started <clears throat> learning how to write the divine word and really studying God's word and more in that. And <clears throat> there's a lot of Pentecostals and Charismatics that love the Lord, but they're sharing a lot of doctrine that is off the wall. That's actually anti-biblical. See, they're trying to go back to Pentecost. They don't know the body of Christ started in Acts 9 with when Christ saved Paul and the dispensation of grace um, began. Paul was the first person in the body of Christ, right? He said he was saved as a pattern for those who would believe that after, right? He was saved completely by grace, God's worst enemy, right? He was persecuting and dragging those kingdom believers off to jail, never killing them and feeding them, right? And Christ saved them by grace. So if Christ can St. Paul, he was a blasphemer. I could just see smoke, steam coming out of his nostrils, going with hate. If he could change Paul and use Paul, don't ever think he can't use you, because he sees you as righteous in Christ. And he says, um, 
which is the earnest, in verse 14, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So that teaches you eternal security. Those who teach you could lose your salvation, um, Arminians or Calvinists, you know, they say you can only be Arminian or only Calvinist. No, I'm, I follow, um, I come from, I'm not a dispensationalist. You're ready to throw me out here. Right? I'm a child of God, a member of the body of Christ who studies the Bible dispensationalist. Because if you follow a movement and they go off, you're going to go off. So I don't got to be a Calvinist. I don't got to be Arminian. Arminian teaches uh, you can lose your salvation. But Calvinism kind of teaches the same. Because if you don't persevere till the end, you are never saved. What's the difference on that, right? Oh, God's word clear as a lot of the dust of tradition, right? And that's been long held in the church. I got a minute. <clears throat> So, let's read verse 4. That we did already. Anyway, I, I had some more, but I'm going to stop, and I'll, I'll start in verse 5 next week. So we see, God doesn't select some to be saved and others to be lost. And remember, keep the context in Ephesians chapter 1. He's writing to believers. He's not writing about unbelievers getting saved there. It's just go there and I'm gonna end. I'm gonna read this first. So God's not choosing some to be saved, but show but before time began, this is what Paul's writing. In Christ, them are believers, that they be holy, blameless, justified in God's eyes. He did this on love. So um, Let's go back there, and I'll end. <clears throat> According to as he has chosen us in him. See, it wasn't chosen us to salvation. Choosing that when we get in Christ, now he has, um, before the foundation of the world, God made that decision that we should be holy. You're set apart. You're a saint. Paul writes to saints, right? Um, and without blame. God sees you without blame. You go, yeah, but God's not blind. No, he dealt with your sins. He saw them. He put them on Christ. Christ suffered and he turned me for your sins. And God says you're forgiven. They're dealt with. You don't got to suffer with the shame and the blame anymore. Now you can get on and press on. I forget the past and I press on, Paul says, right? And so he sees you as holy and without Blame, listen to this, before him in love. That's how he's looking at you. You're accepted in the beloved folk, Moses. I'm going to close. Um, I'm one minute over. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. We, can, we couldn't know any of these things if, you were, if your spirit, through your word, didn't reveal it to us. And your spirit illumined our minds to grasp these truths. And I pray, Father, as we study through the books of Ephesians, that's high, high spiritual truth. That it would just um, grasp our hearts, not only our minds, but our hearts. And it work within our will, and we would apply more and more and um, just redeem the time while we're here, Father. I pray if there's someone who's never trusted in that Christ died for their sins, personally, according to the scriptures, were buried and rose again, so you could declare them righteous and give them spiritual resurrection, eternal life. I pray they would trust right now and make that decision. And then I pray, Father, just for us as believers, not to just let this lay in our heads, but let it truly work in our personal lives and our church life together. In Jesus' name, I pray for you. So, da 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 da, that's all, folks.